I'm a computer scientist, and in my daily life, I'm developing technologies for the film and entertainment industry. But as a matter of fact, today I'm not going to talk about special effects and animation for a change. I'm going to talk about me in my role as a father. And I really want to start my talk with a little story to tell you. This is my son, Adrian. As a matter of fact, this is Adrian back 13 years ago when I started this project. It's a funny little boy, vivid and smart. He talked a little bit too much all the time, but other than that was all good. Except he developed one severe handicap. When he joined elementary school, he soon developed a significant deficit in reading and writing comprehension, and he lagged behind his classmates very quickly. And this went up to the point basically where writing and reading became a true nightmare to him. It took years to diagnose him with a condition called dyslexia. And as a matter of fact, as caretaking parents, my wife and I, we spent a lot of time and effort and finally money to work on therapies with him. And they were all useless. They didn't help. And this frustrated us a lot. Now, observing him over the years, I discovered a bunch of distinct perceptual and cognitive abilities and patterns within him. For instance, his strength in memorizing structural and spatial information. Now, it was actually really his suffering in school that motivated me to embark on a mission and to develop a therapy of my own with the weapons of computer science. And this is what I'm going to introduce to you right now. Now, dyslexia is the distinct disability of some people to read fluently and to write orthographically correct over time. You know, and despite of training efforts, there is no improvement. And this happens in people with average intelligence or even with distinct above-average IQs. Adrian shares this condition with 5 to 10 percent of the population which is affected by this. And dyslexia appears in various forms and shapes and different levels of severity. Now, the symptoms of dyslexia are actually pretty well understood, and they include slow reading and limited writing, but oftentimes also letters are put into the wrong order. A good example is felt versus left. Oftentimes, also dyslexics confuse phonetically or graphically similar letters, such as B and P, D and T, G and K. I called up my son last night and asked him, what is your favorite word as a dyslexic? And he said, it's Vogel, the German word for bird. And he would always write it with an F instead of a V, or fahren for driving, where there is a silent consonant and H, which is not really pronounced, and he always omits it. So dyslexia also comes along oftentimes with a more general attention deficit disorder. But the effect and the devastation of dyslexia is really, really significant because it extends to all other disciplines in school or in professional life. And it oftentimes leads to underperformance and demotivation, which sort of can never be kept caught up again. Now, broadly speaking, dyslexia is caused by an inability of the dyslexic's brain to build up a map between so-called phonemes and graphemes. Phonemes are the elementary building blocks of spoken language. They are the basic sounds like au or chi or i. And graphemes are groups of letters, such as syllables or fractions of a syllable, which build the basic building blocks of written language. Now, neuroscientists have also discovered that, you know, if you start reading as an untrained reader, most of the brain's information processing is happening in the frontal part of the brain. There's frontal activity. Now, as we acquire the skill of reading, there is a shift happening in information processing, and most of the processing happens in the parietal uh, area of the brain. And this so-called frontal parietal shift is not being accomplished properly within dyslexics. 
Now, I teamed up with neuroscientists from the University of Zurich and with a bunch of brilliant PhD students and computer science students from ETH. One Christian is actually sitting in the audience here. And we combined state-of-the-art knowledge from neuroscience and from computer science to develop a new so-called multimodal learning therapy for dyslexia, um, which adapts to the individual capabilities of a child. So let me explain this in a moment. Now, multimodal information processing relates to the fact that the human brain is able to process uh, information simultaneously through different perceptual cues or channels. And such channels can include color information, structural topological information, lighting, sounds, speech, shape, textures, patterns, motion, and so forth and so on. Now, we all develop over time a distinct profile of how our brain develops these individual channels. And I, for my part, might prefer color and shape, and you might prefer sounds or motion in combination. Now, the core idea of the learning approach is to reroute the information that is embedded in a word, in this example, Mike Zurich, through different uh, perceptual pathways. And this is accomplished by transcoding the word, by re-representing the word into a variety of different codes. One is a topological structural code, another one is a color code, there is also a musical code synthesized by the system, and a shape code. This all leads to a multimodal representation addressing as many as possible uh, perceptual pathways into the brain at the same time. And in order to control the information that is associated with this transcoding, we use a concept that is well known from information theory and statistics. It's called the entropy. It measures the disorder, if you will. Now, this transcoding is combined with a powerful concept of so-called machine learning. And the machine learning component uh, basically develops a so-called student model, a mathematical representation of the child's uh, actual learning capabilities and preferences and strengths and weaknesses. And it refines it over time as the child works with the system. And this allows us to apply the learning in a personalized and individualized way to the child. So it picks the next word in such a way that it's most effective to the child's disability and reduces the error in the best possible mathematical way, if you will. Here is how it looks like. The large picture shows actually this multimodal representation. Now you see the structural code, which is the so-called syllable tree of the word might Zurich, or of this group of words. Then you also can see that each letter is associated with a distinct color. Some letters, for instance, the capital M, has a different shape than the small cap letters, and umlauts here for German language or for French would be represented with yet another shape. Also, there is a musical code associated with it. The musical code um, is, gives each color a distinct note on a pentatonic scale. What's a pentatonic scale? If you look at the piano and you look at all the black keys, that's the pentatonic scale. Now, try it out. If you push these keys in a random order and at random speed, it will always sound nicely. So that's the idea. Now, also, what we associate is different instruments to different shapes to better distinct and to trust the multimodality. And finally, what we do is length of the note in the composition is basically related to the length of the syllable. To compute the color code, which is the mapping of these eight distinct colors to individual groups of letters, it's specific for each language, and it follows a very complex mathematical optimization procedure. But the training is super simple, and here's an illustration. So you see that the child, first of all, plays this little memory game and repeats the colors and gets the feedback with the sound. And then, in a second step, uh, you acquaint yourself with a structural topological code by basically uh, redrawing the syllable graph, note also the colors and the musical feedback. And then you train. 
And it shows this multimodal representation. It's three-dimensional graphics. It's animated. It's cool. You can touch it, and you can interact with we it. See. And you just repeat the word. So if you make a mistake, then you get an immediate visual feedback, like here. And you know the system encourages you to retype it and to correct it. That's all it does. And it represents the words, the sequence in which you learn in the best possible mathematical way. Now, the underlying machine intelligence for each incorrectly spelled word computes a hypothesis on the nature of the error. So, for instance, here's an example in German. The word Unmut would be misspelled, so instead of an M in the middle, the child types an N, and there might be three different sources possible for error. One is a simple typo on the keyboard because N and M are next to each other. A second possible source of error could be an auditory confusion because N and M sound similarly. You know, and the third one could be the most severe one. It's a problem in the grapheme phoneme map uh, built up in your brain. And this error hypothesis and error categorization of the underlying machine intelligence, that's essential to adjust to the child and to build up this mathematical model of the child's learning. Now, we carried out a variety of user studies uh, here in Switzerland and in Germany, mostly with children aged 8 to 12 over the years. And these proved the efficiency and the effectiveness of the methods. So after three months of training, four days a week, 15 to 20 minutes, we found an improvement, an average improvement of the performance in writing, in paper and pencil tests, which means dictation, of more than 30%. And what is really remarkable is that the system and the approach generalizes to non-trained words. That is, if you present the child an unknown word, which was not in the training database, then the average improvement is still over 25%. And what was also interesting, after you stop the learning, most of the effect is remanent and still available after three to six months. This compares to the control group of dyslexics without training, which only uh, displayed a mild improvement of 6% due to the ordinary school training. Now, what we also found, we carried out a study with adults, and it works equally well with adults. Um, finally, the system is also very effective for non-dyslexic children, and it works as a vocabulary trainer and in different languages. Now, we use it in a large number of Swiss schools at present, uh, primarily in the German-speaking part of Switzerland, and over the years we trained more than 60,000 children successfully and got a lot of positive feedback from the parents, because I know as a parent it is really, really uh, emotionally uh, tearing uh, and requires a lot of effort on the parent's side. Um, what's also remarkable is, ever since we started five years ago, we tabulated and stored each and every keystroke of each and every child which ever trained with the system, along with a timestamp. And this gives us a true treasure. It's a huge data repository into which we could dig in with other mathematical methods or big data analytics to discover distinct patterns and effects and phenomena. For instance, one we discover is that there are groups of children who seem to have similar features, that is, they seem to have similar difficulties or similar behaviors in learning. Uh, and this is very valuable to improve the mathematical model underlying uh, the system. Also, we hope that we will be able, through the data analytics we are doing, to develop a predictive power of the system so that the system can diagnose or can indicate that a child probably has dyslexia just by letting it work with the system for some time. Now, motivated by the success in dyslexia, we, a couple of years ago, uh, ventured into a related condition, which is called dyscalculia. It's less well known, but it relates to the disability of children uh, to develop mathematical skills. And it's equally devastating, and there is an equal number, percentage of the population, 5 to 7 percent, typically affected by it. And this is the equivalent uh, for dyscalculia. 
Now, with all this work over all these years, motivated actually by father's desire to help his son initially, we believe that we developed a very simple and more importantly, a very effective way of training and attacking dyslexia with the powers of computer science, information theory, and machine learning. And we hope that we can generalize or extend some of these concepts to other fields of learning as well. Now, back to Adrian. Uh, he is now 25 years old and a student of, guess what? Computer science. Computer science. Yes, you got it. Thank you very much.